It's already difficult to keep track of our home network. We have to worry about hackers breaking in or third parties collecting identifiers like IP addresses and locations. But we have at least some semblance of control since the internet has to come in through our modem and router that we can monitor or even firewall. We have to contend with other networks. The one that's a basic part of our mobile phone use is the cell network. It's part of the fact that there are dangerous hacks that can allow access to the cell radio in our mobile phone. There's also some semblance of control once again since there's a SIM card. The SIM card determines where we connect. What I will focus on today is a new kind of network and unlike the two other networks that pass our data, this one is the unknown beast because it can operate without any kind of user control. This one operates without an internet. It allows our devices to work for big tech and not the other way around. It allows for networking slaves. This network allows location control down to centimeters. This network allows for control of devices that are powered off. This network allows for centralized control, possibly in the hands of one man or one AI. Stay right there to learn about the secret network and how it can be misused. I'm on the platform odyssey.com. I'm now one of the top creators on there. Just in case I get the platform, please follow me there using the link in the description. My company has several products, Bytes VPN, DGoogle phones, VPN routers, and now we offer a Braxmail email service. These products are made to protect you from big tech. If you're interested in them, they are on my app Braxme and the link is in the description. The secret network I'm going to talk about today is the mesh network. I'm going to explain this new dilemma we are in with this mesh network in several stages. First, I will explain how a mesh network works, but do not rush to leave if you think you know this already because the second part of this deals with the actual risks of a mesh network. What is a network? When multiple devices interact with each other to communicate, that is called a network. The most ubiquitous network of all is, of course, the internet. Here we have billions of devices communicating with each other around the world and are robust enough to allow transfer of large amounts of data. For example, like a multi-gigabyte video stream. The Wi-Fi and cell data networks are two networks designed to send lots of sustained traffic to the internet. The power usage is also very high. There's a new way to propagate traffic over the airwaves and unlike the other methods of networking, this requires very little power. It achieves this by sending only small chunks of data and when it is not transmitting or connecting to devices, it turns the radio off. It attains reliable communications by having large numbers of listening devices and transmitting signals to these multiple devices at once. The multiple listeners then have the ability to propagate the messages received by forwarding the message to other devices until one is found with an internet connection. Then it can forward the message on to its final big tech destination. This kind of network is what I call a mesh network. This, by the way, has nothing to do with the Wi-Fi mesh network sold by Google and others that expand the range of the Wi-Fi. So don't get confused with how the terminology is used. I'm going to refine the terminology a little later, but it requires me to discuss the different protocols for constructing a mesh network. Originally, this mesh network was intended to power your Internet of Things devices, or IoT, in your homes. This includes home automation equipment, security systems like cameras and motion detectors, home appliances, switches, and lights. So its heavy use was supposed to be for automating the operation of a building. There are three popular mesh networking protocols. The one used by Google is called Google Thread and is part of Google Nest products. Then there is Zigbee, which is heavily used in home automation as well. Today, I'll focus on explaining the operation of the most popular of these mesh networking protocols, and that is Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE. In general, all these protocols transmit and receive signals in the 2.4 GHz range, which is the same area as Wi-Fi. The Zigbee protocol is able to transmit in the 915 MHz range and also in the 800 MHz range, although it supports 2.4 GHz as well. There's another protocol that's popular in the 915 MHz range, and this is LoRa. 
LoRa is longer range and is not intended for the specific mesh network use as the other protocol, so I will not focus on it. The problem with the lower frequencies from 800 megahertz to 900 megahertz range is that these frequencies are not licensed to operate in all regions. And for this reason, they can be used only in some areas like North America. So for widespread use worldwide, the more popular frequency is a 2.4 gigahertz range. The general rule is that the lower the frequency, the less it is affected by obstructions. The higher the frequency, the more it needs line of sight. Many of you already know this. The 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi has a longer range, but the 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi is easily blocked by walls and obstructions. However, it has a much higher bandwidth. 2.4 gigahertz has a shorter range than the 915 megahertz frequencies used by LoRa and Zigbee. However, that is more than made up by the number of listening devices. Let's focus now specifically on Bluetooth BLE, which is head and shoulders the most popular mesh networking protocol available today. It is the main protocol used by products such as Apple AirTag, Tile Trackers, and used in Amazon Echoes and Ring cameras. It is operating in most newer iPhones. It exists as a capability in most newer Android phones. Bluetooth has been around since 1994 and many of you are aware of it as a protocol mostly used for wireless headphones and wireless speakers. One of the characteristics of this Bluetooth protocol called Bluetooth Classic is that it is very short range. Typically they work only within 10 feet. But they are able to handle sustained traffic, enough to be able to pass through your media like audio. And they minimize power use by keeping the distance of the transmission short. When Bluetooth 4.0 was introduced, it allowed for a new Bluetooth protocol, one we know now as Bluetooth Low Energy, and it allowed this protocol use on the existing Bluetooth radio. So, the same hardware. So all the devices supporting Bluetooth 4.0 has the capability to support Bluetooth Low Energy. As far as I know, all new devices with Bluetooth like mobile phones have Bluetooth 4.0 or higher. So this likely includes every phone in the last three to four years. There is a newer Bluetooth standard, by the way, which is Bluetooth 5.0 and the prior one, which is Bluetooth 4.2. Now, just to give you a general idea of the widespread availability of BLE, the Bluetooth Association claims that they have shipped 1 billion BLE capable devices each year since 2020. Clearly, this is very widespread. Bluetooth is sold as part of an SOC or system on a chip, so it is often part of the motherboard of the phones. The range of Bluetooth radios range from 50 meters outdoors and 10 meter indoors in Bluetooth 4.0 all the way to 200 meters outdoors and 40 meters indoors for Bluetooth 5.0. Given the number of available devices it can interact with, it is almost practically guaranteed that a device will be able to connect with many other devices just from the ubiquity of Bluetooth radios. BLE works like this. First, each node determines its functions. Some BLE nodes are known as broadcasters. Their job is to transmit a beacon or in some cases actual data if the device is a sensor. For example, Apple AirTags just broadcasts an identifier and it does this continuously. A device like an AirTag uses very little power even though it can transmit in a distance longer than Bluetooth Classic of 3 meters. Like I said earlier, this is typically 50 meters outdoors in line of sight. The way it does this is that it broadcasts very short pulses of data. In fact, this is the main limitation of BLE. It is not intended for extensive communications. It is meant to send short bursts of data and this is suited more for sending commands and for sending sensor data like identifiers, location, and temperature. When it is not sending data, it turns the radio off. So instead of a radio being constantly on, the power saving occurs from being mostly off. The way it ensures that the message gets transmitted to other nodes is by way of a multicast. In other words, it doesn't need to establish individual connections with single devices. It can send a message to multiple devices at once, thus ensuring reliability of message forwarding. The Bluetooth nodes listening for BLE signals are called observers. These are mostly just listening for signals and don't need to transmit anything from and to Bluetooth. For purposes of visualization, think of the AirTag as the broadcaster and then the iPhones as observers. So observers are listening for AirTag BLE data. Now understand this. 
Every device with Bluetooth 4.0 and above can hear all BLE messages. However, each BLE message has a short identifier that tells the observer if this is something to listen to. In other words, the Apple iPhone will ignore all other BLE messages that are not intended for Apple. This is what Apple is boasting about when they say that BLE messages from AirTags are secure since they use elliptical curve encryption. This is in fact true and is part of the BLE standard. The BLE standard also defines that the encryption keys are negotiated out of band or outside BLE, which is also true. This is in fact what Apple is touting as its special security, which is just the standard. I'll explain why this is flawed a little later. The main point is that BLE messages cannot be intercepted in the middle and decrypted by a means that we are aware of today. So aside from being able to tell that the BLE traffic belongs to Apple or Amazon, we can't really decipher the BLE traffic if you set up a BLE observer application. Now let's expand our understanding of this. So far we have talked about a broadcaster. There are also other roles in BLE which allow an ongoing connection between two BLE devices called central and another mode called peripheral where a BLE device can be sent instructions like turning on and off. This is more for devices like lights and phones as we will talk about later. For the mesh networking use, I'll focus mostly on the broadcaster and observer modes for now. What is interesting is that the choice of an operating mode of a BLE capable device may depend on its power level. For example, a phone that is powered on and is connected to the internet can be a simple observer. Then from its programming, it can recognize a BLE message that is intended for Apple and will simply forward a BLE message in its original form over the internet to a specific server at Apple HQ. There's more to this with AirTags, by the way, but I'll explain it later. Let's say that the iPhone does not currently have an internet connection. Let's just say that it doesn't have cell service because it has no SIM card and that currently it is not connected to Wi-Fi. In this case, after the phone has behaved as a BLE observer, it can then change role and become a BLE broadcaster and then forward the same message which can be heard by other iPhones. This chain of forwarding messages can continue until the message encounters a device with an internet connection. You can see the brilliance of this. Each broadcaster is also always multicasting so the message could theoretically travel for many, many miles until it encounters a device with internet. Some things to recognize here which will identify red flags later on. Here's a scenario. This is apparently now how the iPhone works. The iPhone is powered off. However, the power connection to the BLE module is not powered off. And the BLE module now acts as a broadcaster, pinging the location of the phone. The supposed purpose of this is to spot stolen phones. So even when your iPhone is off, it can point to your location. Absolute craziness. While your iPhone is on, the phone can use the internet connection to send Apple its location. With the power off, it will use other iPhones nearby to forward its location to Apple while in low power mode. Some other things to think about. All communications are peer-to-peer. -peer. This means that each device will operate with any other BLE device with no interference from any third party. To put it in more black and white terms, you personally have no control over the BLE functionality of your own device. You cannot stop it. Bluetooth BLE, by the way, operates independently of Bluetooth Classic. In other words, you can be listening on your headphones with Bluetooth Classic without affecting the functionality of BLE. So they are separate radios. So the Bluetooth BLE mesh network is the most expansive mesh network since it has the most devices. On top of phones, Amazon also supports BLE using Amazon Echo devices and Ring cameras. It is really interesting to see how you buy the devices and then the biggest users of the devices are actually big tech companies. Multiple mesh networks can coexist using BLE, so Amazon mesh network transmissions are not affected by Apple transmissions. Each BLE device filters only what it is programmed to accept and ignores the rest. A small company can program their own mesh network using BLE. However, the BLE transmission can be propagated only as long as there are devices within range that can recognize the mesh network identifier as belonging to this small company. As you can see, BLE's usefulness for running a small mesh network, 
like in a building since it can enable devices to respond to switching commands when they are in peripheral mode. What it allows is wireless control. But the effect of this technology is completely different when a metropolitan area is blanketed with millions of BLE radios belonging to the same mesh network, since here it forms a separate network that's capable of incredible surveillance capabilities. Any programmer is able to create a BLE mesh network using an Android while that programmer's app is running, and that's what Tile does. However, if the app is not running, then there's no functionality, so a small player cannot power a large mesh network. You can see here that BLE's ability to blanket a population does not work unless you have the scale of an Apple or Amazon. Fortunately, Google has not yet created a centralized mesh network on Android. So at the moment, the most expansive mesh network is definitely Apple since there are more Apple products with mesh capability than Amazon. One of the unique capabilities of the Bluetooth BLE is the ability to determine directionality. In other words, a BLE observer not only can tell that a BLE device is nearby, it can also determine a compass heading to the BLE broadcaster. This capability to determine location, which I'm thinking is possible by having multiple antennas, means that BLE is a supremely capable location device. In fact, it is claimed that the BLE device can be located within 10 centimeters of its actual position. Let's summarize our analysis of Bluetooth BLE and its threat profile to our privacy. Number one, BLE is a threat that's directly proportional to the size of the mesh network. And by the way, there's no other large mesh network utilizing Zigbee or Google Thread. In other words, watch is creating the large mesh networks. At the moment, there are only two large mesh networks, and that is Apple and Amazon. I'm specifically concerned about how Apple has implemented this because with a blanketing of the area with a widespread mesh network that includes phones that are powered off, we have a deadly way that tracks personal devices on our person. Number two, BLE is at the control only of the single company that owns the mesh network. On Apple devices, no one can interfere with whatever Apple wants to send and receive over the BLE network. Since traffic is encrypted between it and Apple HQ, we do not even know what traffic can be sent or received. Amazon runs the second largest mesh network with Amazon Echoes and Ring cameras. And maybe they'll turn it on on Fire TVs in the future. Number three. BLE devices are going to be amazing at pinpointing a location of a device. It will beat Wi-Fi triangulation, which already has a potential of six feet. Now we're talking inches. When a device is a personal device like a phone, then you can imagine it means knowing exactly where you are. And obviously from there, you can deduce who you are with and therefore an excellent deduction of reasons for the contact. So a feature capable of extreme contact tracing tracking. Number four, BLE devices can not only send data, but can receive instructions. Just as a BLE device can be a peripheral that can be turned on and off, think of this functionality on a phone. Apple or Amazon could give instructions to a device that's off to turn on for surveillance reasons. Since an iPhone that's off could receive instructions to turn on, it can then receive further instructions over the internet to perform specific surveillance tasks. This is something I've already been worried about with the client-side scanning capability of Apple. The AI could be instructed to turn on the camera and observe its surroundings and could be initiated even when the device is off originally. Number five, the elliptical curve encryption of BLE is a red herring. Understand the practical implementation of encryption here. While it is true that an outsider would never know the content of a BLE message, the message itself is end-to-end -end encrypted only with Apple HQ. The applicable term here is transport encryption. This is not true end-to-end -end encryption in the sense that the metadata hurts the BLE observer. The encrypted payload in theory is the identity of the AirTag. So the AirTag sends out a message announcing its identity. As defined in the standard, the AirTag encryption uses elliptical curve encryption and has to be negotiated by the sender and receiver via an offline method. In the case of the AirTag and its owner, this is negotiated by the owner of the AirTag and the negotiated keys are stored in iCloud for that user, which Apple can see, but that's a separate story.
So far, this matches what Apple claims about the security of AirTag. What they do not say is that the BLE Observer is an iPhone. That iPhone cannot alter the original BLE message since that was encrypted ahead of time. But the AirTag identifier is not the full data payload. The rest of the data is A, the location of the current Observer iPhone, and B, the direction of the AirTag in relation to it. This data does not come from the AirTag. It comes from the Observer phone. This then has to be sent to Apple. So yes, the AirTags are encrypted. The bad news is that the Observer iPhone is in fact observed and the location noted. In other words, iPhones are surveilled not just by their own Find My Phone features, but also in relation to AirTags around it, just as I explained in a prior video. Number six, mesh networking power begets more power. Only those mesh networks with massive reach like Apple and Amazon can really provide reach and risk. Google, of course, is positioned to also establish a wide area mesh network if it desires to. In order to do this, these companies need to put BLE mesh networking inside the operating system. That way they cannot be turned off. This is exactly what has occurred with Apple and Amazon. The problem is that what the mesh network can do is unlimited. We cannot know or even limit the messaging capabilities of BLE. With multicasting, it is even improbable that you can jam BLE in an area large enough to defeat multicasting. This has some extreme implications with slave devices. It means that a large company can actually control devices far away from itself by making BLE devices operate in peripheral mode. And as you already have heard, an Apple can have BLE enabled even when the power is off. This means devices can turn themselves on en masse. Once on, devices can then receive more specific operational instructions from high bandwidth connections. But the implications of this bring Skynet to mind, remote control of large numbers of devices, all under the control of a single company, and even perhaps one person or one AI. Folks, that's what I do in my channel. I teach you about the technology and how it can be misused. What can be promoted as a benign technology to allow the use of Apple AirTags is powerful enough to be the future foundation of Skynet 2.0. Thank you for watching.